Hi everyone, this will be our lecture for Friday, January 22nd. Um, we're going to talk quickly about where we left off in terms of discussing the metric system and units and conversions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, we'll touch a little bit on the kind of thinking that uh, I want to be sure that we are practicing while we solve any of our physics problems. And uh, then we'll start talking about motion and describing in uh, detail the physical concepts of position, distance, displacement, speed, velocity, and maybe even we'll start talking about acceleration. Um, certainly that'll be our main focus of discussion next week. So when we last met um, yesterday, if you're watching this on Friday, two days ago, we discussed the metric system and a little bit about converting units from one metric value to, or converting quantities, I should say, from one metric value to another metric unit, a different value with different units. Um, quick reminder that the, um, cat hair on the microphone, quick reminder that the beauty of the metric system is that everything is based off of powers of 10. So we have these, um, this table from our text where we discussed the important um, prefixes that we should be used to working with centi and milli and kilo, especially for uh, distances, for instance, we are probably familiar with centimeters and kilometers. Um, sometimes for other values, we might use the prefix micro and nano. Um, our everyday measuring distances, we typically don't talk about micro and nano. When we are machining things to very, very, very tight tolerances, we might talk about micrometers. Um, nanometers are applicable in terms of um, distances that are important in various biological and chemical processes. So these, in terms of length, these units do come about um, very, very often. So if we were to... Um, use some of these values to convert from one thing to another. Let's practice our conversions first. This table uh, that I have a copy of here in the slides is useful because um, there are sometimes when we need to think about an everyday sized object in a unit that we typically don't use. Uh, as Americans, we don't use the metric system very often. For some of us, this might be the first time we're really using the metric system every time we do something in the course. So it's helpful to have these. Again, you can always shout into your um, phone or your home monitoring system. I have a Google, uh, whatever the hell it's called, the Nest, right? Is that Google or is that Amazon? Whatever it is. My brother bought it for me. We use it every once in a while. Most of the time, I shout at it various things like, Google, hey, Google, how many inches are in a meter? Thirty-nine point three seven. That's going to be the. Hey, look at that! How many inches are in a meter, right? So these things are out there. We don't need to commit them all to memory. However, um, it is useful to have a few of these in our back pocket, or at least know where to look them up uh, in case we ever need them. the The most useful thing to do is after we do the unit conversion, though, to take the result to make sure we can make sense of a numerical quantity uh, that represents a physical thing. So here's here's some instances of that. If we were to practice converting um, 156 kilometers to inches, maybe we have lost track of how big of a kilometer it is, but we can really interpret an inch. Is it a lot of inches? Is it a few inches? What are we going to do? Let's remember our conversion technique. We have on the numerator here, let's get a, a more peaceful color. We'll use blue. 156 kilometers. We're going to multiply by one in the form of physical unity. So I'm going to probably, my roadmap will be kilometers to meters to um, inches using that 30, what did we have in the previous? We'll use what we just shouted at Google, 39.37. So we'll just go three, three levels deep. Um, I know that there are 1,000 meters in one kilometer. So again, that value in parentheses is unity in the sense that the top and the bottom are the same thing. They are two different numbers, though. One is a thousand, one is one, 
but in terms of physical quantities, they are the same. Therefore, I can multiply by physical unity and numerically change the result, but not physically change the value that I have. That's the important thing that I hope we realize that we're doing. This will give me the answer in meters. And I'm going to do that one more time with that 39.97 inches in one meter. And that's going to give me 156 times 1,000 times 39.97. In that many kilometers, I have 6.24 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 inches. So I have 6 million inches, 6.24 million inches in 156 kilometers. Uh, just to quickly practice this unit conversion again, just to see it in a context that is not length. We don't always have to do length. Uh, six quarts, two milliliters. So let's see. We're going to use some of our everyday knowledge here. I have six quarts. There are four cups to a quart. So I have four cups in one quart. There are eight ounces in a cup. And then I gotta go from ounces to milliliters. Um, I drink things in cans every once in a while, and if you look at a can of soda pop, what did you think was in my cans? Um, we have 300 and, what number is it? Let me check the one I have right here. 355 milliliters in, that can is 12 fluid ounces. So here again, I have to not necessarily always have one on the bottom. Sometimes these conversions, just in terms of an everyday object, I know in a 12 ounce can, I have 12 fluid ounces and 355 milliliters simultaneously. Those are equivalent. So that's my conversion factor there. Um, this will give me multiplying and then dividing six times four times eight times 355 divided by 12 would give me 5,680 milliliters. Be sure that we are comfortable with those conversions so that we can um, convert between things, especially when we get to um, quantities that might not be easy or trivial for Google to convert from one thing to another. For instance, it is usually pretty good at converting a length to a different length, a volume to a different volume, which is what we've just been practicing here. But if we were to have um, derived units, different units for density, later we will have various things like specific heats, and uh, we might even have more than one unit for energy if we want to talk about um, British th thermal units and joules. Things like Google can get tripped up, and it's not that it's totally confused. It's that it doesn't often give you the first result what you want, so it's good to know how to do it as well. Um, we'll come back to talking about derived quantities in just a second. We might go back to furlongs per fortnight. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, just touching on how we... One, one thing that we can think about in terms of the way that we're... That we can talk about, rather, in terms of the way that we're thinking... Um, here I have a question posed on this, which is the thickness of a single sheet of paper in your textbook. Or you could even say, in, um, uh, instead of a textbook, you could also ask the question, just for discussion's sake, what is the thickness of you know, standard computer paper? And just like that, a little while ago when I pulled out the everyday knowledge of ounces and cups and quarts, and then there was the, well, I know 12 ounces is 355 milliliters. Now, again, I don't have that committed to memory. I happen to have a can right here, and it's listed as both. But what I did there was I didn't say, well, I don't have that from memory, so I don't know it. I used something that was right next to me, and I said, well, I can figure that out by looking at that thing. So it's not whether or not we know the thickness of a sheet of paper. It's do we know how we can get that. And as we work, even just the rest of the lecture today and Monday's lecture, we're going to do some very simple physics um, concepts that we're going to introduce. 
I want to stress that these aren't new things. You've already experienced your world, right? So you're not a blank slate that we are putting information on top of. You already have certain bits of knowledge that we can use because the things we talk about have to fit into the world that we experience. So if all I wanted was for you to know what the thickness of a sheet of paper is, you might say, I either know it or I don't. And if you say, how would I measure it? You'd say, well, I would need some very sensitive micrometer and a sheet of paper, and I would measure it. But there's ways that we can think about these things, just like with that beer can, soda can, uh, in terms of, well, I have something that already gives me a volume conversion printed right on it. If you've ever seen a bunch of computer paper, uh, pardon me, it may not camera, but I'm picking this up off the floor. I'm picking it up off the floor. Right, here's how computer paper is sold in a ream of a certain number of sheets. Now, standard is 500 sheets, and if we didn't know that, it says right on the package, but if you didn't know that, I mean, you've probably seen this, and you just need to pay more attention to the things around you. There are always 500 sheets. So this is what 500 sheets look like. And furthermore, I don't even need to measure this to get a good estimate of it. Um, this is about two inches, I'd say, right? Two inches, wouldn't you say? If you've ever handled a ream of paper, perhaps you can agree with that. It's two inches. Certainly it's not a half an inch. Certainly it's not 400 inches, right? It's not 10,000 feet. It's not one width of a human hair, right? We have a good way to, to estimate this. And I would encourage you to go ahead and take that, take that leap. Say, well, this is about two inches. Maybe it's a little bit more. Maybe it's a little bit less. But if we're familiar with inches, it's not one and it's not three. So two is as good a guess as anything. Now let's see what we get if we were to say that this two inches is the thickness for 500 sheets. So I have 500 sheets is two inches. So if I were to take two inches and divide by 500, that's one two fiftieth. That's 0 .004, 0 .004 inches. Now, if I'm going to convert that to centimeters, right? I would have uh, 2.54 centimeters in one inch. 0 .004 times 2.54, and I get 0 .01. 0 .01 centimeters. So earlier we had a, well, here are useful length. Let's see how close we got to what the quote true value is. A uh, sheet of a 10 times 10 to the minus four. I mean, I thought I was highlighting. I didn't mean to cross it out. Oh, we can't see it. There we go. 10 to the minus four meters. So that's point zero 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 one. One, two, right? So that's 0 0.0001, 1, 2, 3, 4 meters, which would equal, if I multiply that by 100 to get centimeters, 0 0.01, right, moving this to, right? The point I'm trying to make is we don't have to rely on truths for these values to be in a table, and if I didn't find the table, I couldn't possibly have known the thickness of a sheet of paper. All we did was take a random, not a random, a set amount of paper, and we estimated, we just looked at the thing and said, that's probably two inches. The point that we're making is that we're pretty good at that. If we have a somewhat quantitative scientific mind, everyone in this course, I'm going to guess, has that by the nature of the choice that you've made for your major to make it a required course. Um, we should take those estimations as pretty good until we can show that they aren't good and then we change them. It's really not that hard of a thing to do. So being able to look at something and saying, I, I know how big that thing is. I can make a pretty good guess. More important is looking at a value and saying, that value seems way off, um, or that value is much too large, or that value is much too small. And that kind of check-in is a good skill to make sure that we have. So over the next few classes, we're going to be doing this a little more explicitly, and then it'll come up naturally as we need it to um, throughout the rest of our discussions and the rest of our material. Let me skip that. Okay. Uh, this is a question that I'm going to pose to you for uh, outside of class mini kind of homework. 
thinking about the weight of the air in the room that you were in, you'll have to make some guesses. You'll have to uh, think about how big the room is. And you'll have to do some research to find out what the density of air at atmospheric pressure is. I want you to start honing those skills of, well, how am I going to guess the size of this room? How am I going to find um, the density of air? And then you're going to have to think carefully about the units that you're working with. So this will be posted on Blackboard, and I'll direct your attention there to find that. Now, let's talk about motion. All of this first unit and most of our second unit is going to be um, concerned with how things move, describing the way things move, and understanding why things move the way that they do. We'll spend most of our time talking about motion in a straight line um, for this first chapter, uh, or chapter two, but the first chapter that we're discussing it. Um, we'll talk about projectile motion, which will be motion in two dimensions, like we see with that basketball. Then in right around chapter five, after we've talked about Newton's laws, we'll talk about circular motion and rotational motion a little bit after that. Um, so we are looking at different kinds of motion and our goal is to have a way to describe how it happens. Now, I love this picture because if I really think about this picture, that Winnebago RV never took physics. That basketball never took physics. In all my years of teaching, I've never taught a basketball. That top never took physics. Those motorcycle riders might have taken physics, but the motorcycles never took physics. And if you've ever watched one of those races, it gets most exciting when the rider and the motorcycle separate and the motorcycle still moves, and it behaves according to the laws of physics, but that motorcycle never took physics. The point I'm trying to make is we can't lose sight of the fact that we are describing motion for the first little bit. And one thing I will never be happy to hear you say is that things happen because of physics. It's not that things happen because of physics. Physics describes what's going on and maybe allows us to predict what's going to happen next. But it's never the reason why something happened. It describes what happened, and the universe is on its own, doing its own thing. Physics is a human construct to describe the events that are happening. Okay, let's start talking about what I mean by that. In order to talk about, talk about things moving, we have to talk about how things stay still, right? We have to define position. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to agree on a coordinate system. Anytime we solve a problem, anytime we describe any situation where something might be moving, we're going to have to say this is the coordinate system. Now, we might not always define a two-dimensional coordinate system, and it might not always be the Cartesian coordinate system like we see on the screen here. Um, it might just be a single dimension, and we have to say, well, this is where we're starting, and that starting point is also what really defines that coordinate system. Where is zero? Where is zero and which way is positive? Typically, we will agree on the coordinate system, again, that we see on the screen here, where to the right is positive. Maybe we might even call that the x direction and to the, uh, in the upward direction. I almost said to the up. Oh, boy. <laughs> upward is positive. We might call it the y direction. We don't have to have this coordinate system, though. There might be times when a different choice in coordinate system is preferred, and we might like to say to the left is positive or down is positive. We might even say, this will blow your mind, we might even say down is positive x. If I'm only moving down, why not call it positive x? So we are always free to choose a different coordinate system, but the important thing is we have to know what coordinate system we're working with for our answers to be consistent and if we're communicating with somebody else, we have to let them know what our coordinate system is. Otherwise, there might be some confusion. So I will try to always be explicit in our coordinate system. If I'm not, it's probably assumed that it's our usual Cartesian coordinate system, where to the, let's see if I get it right, I had to flip myself, to the right is positive x. As I'm doing it now, it's to the left, but I can see myself on the screen, so to the right, as you're looking at it, to the right is positive x. So, First, let's answer this question. Let's consider this question. Here's Frank. He's at a location x equals 3 meters. Okay, so we've defined at least a number line kind of coordinate system. Uh, let's draw a little picture of our buddy Frank. So let's see. There, this question is still there. Here's, here's the floor, perfectly drawn. 
So I'm basically saying if this is x equals 0, 1, 2, x equals 3. And there's Frank at time t equals 0. So now he moves 5 meters away over a time of 10 seconds. Think carefully about where Frank is. Let's assume that he moves along this line, right? He's not going to move up or down or in or out or anything like that. He's just going to move to the right or left. And he moves five meters away from his starting point. Take a moment, maybe pause the video. Think about, you can probably do this calculation in your head. Where is Frank if he moves five meters away? So here's some choices, right? Question's the same, so I can block it with my picture for a little bit. Now, looking at these choices, you might not have thought about all these answers. Um, so if I'm at three, perhaps our first thought, we might have chosen answer number one, right? Because we can draw a number line. Here's x equals zero, one, two, three. There's Frank at time t equals zero. And he moves five meters away. So there's four, five, six, whoop, seven, eight. So now Frank has gone one, two, three, four, five, and he's at x equals eight. Whoops, suddenly I made him taller. Don't worry about Frank's growth. And that's not x equals zero, that's x equals eight. And let me just change my screen, make sure, yeah, I'm still on the in the frame, okay. Certainly, we can't get to zero by combining three and five, so this is just there to give us enough choices. But perhaps we didn't think about this case, right? We never said which way he moves. We just said he moves. Right? We didn't say he moves to the left or he moves to the right. He just moves. So perhaps we didn't realize, well, I can move one, two, three, four, five. And sure enough, I can arrive at minus two. And if both of these choices are possible, then our only true answer is, wait, 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 wait. You didn't tell me which way he moved. I need to think about the direction that he moves. Um, not necessarily everything has to move in the positive direction, depending on our choice of coordinate system and the actual system that we're talking about. So this brings into uh, the discussion the need to understand the difference between distance and displacement. When we have... Um, distance, that's just how far we are between two points in space, right? Technically, to have a position, we need to have both that agreed upon zero starting point, reference location, whatever you want to call it, and a unit of measurement. The distance between two positions is just how far apart they are. The displacement is the overall change from where I started to where I ended, and we see that there is a sign associated with the displacement. I can have positive or negative displacements depending on the direction of the coordinate system that I use. So in our previous example, Frank could move positive five, have a displacement of positive five meters from where he started. That would be three plus five is eight. Or he could have a displacement of negative five meters from where he started. So that would be a displacement of or a final position, excuse me, of starts at 3 plus negative 5 gives me negative 2. So the displacement is always found by thinking about the difference between the initial and final positions. Now this is an important point that I'm going to stress throughout this semester, which is whenever we're finding um, a, a difference between initial and final values, we are always taking final minus initial. If there was an alternate universe where I actually had a um, stockbroker that's like, uh, I called every day and I said, well, what's the final, what's the result of today's stock market on my portfolio? Um, I would expect that they would give me the final value of the stock market, of my stocks at that day minus the initial value and that would tell me whether over the course of that day I increased the value in my portfolio or I decreased, right? So I always take final minus initial. So if we think about what Frank did, we could either have, let's say Frank went from x 
uh, 1 equals 3 to x 2 equals 8, right? Well, his delta x would be 8 minus, sorry, I got a little jumble there, 3, which would equal positive 5. That was the moving to the right that we talked about. Or we could have the alternate um, possibility where he started at 3 and he moved to negative 2. Notice how we will get an answer that corresponds to the motion if we do minus 2 minus 3 gives me negative 5, right? So those displacements, x delta x is positive 5 or delta x equals negative 5, those are the two different ways that Frank could move on that number line, that part of the coordinate system. He can move to the right, positive 5. He can move to the left, negative 5. Note how we can get from, um, we can rearrange this formula to x1, sorry, x2. This is what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make. x2 is x1 plus delta x. All I've done is algebraically rearrange that. So if we take this case, case number one, where I'm moving to the right, and let's say I told you instead of he moves five meters, I was explicit and I said he moves positive five meters from his starting location. Well, his final location is his initial location plus the change in his location, his displacement. So I would have three meters plus positive five meters equals positive 8 meters. You might say, why did you write plus plus? Well, here's why. In the second case, let's say I said Frank moved negative 5 meters. The point I want to make is that I'm always going to think of x1 plus delta x. We'll see why when we get into vectors. Here's my initial, and I'm going to add my displacement. I'm not going to subtract five meters. I'm going to add negative five meters. And that's going to give me three plus minus five is minus two. Now you might say, oh, Mr. Pollock is really off his rocker. He's going to make a big stink about plus negative versus minus. Yes. Yes, I am. I haven't subtracted in years and I've never felt better. Once I really decided to be a physicist seriously sometime throughout my undergraduate and I said, yep, this is it. I haven't subtracted since. Now, of course, that's a little bit of a of a joke, I subtract all the time. But when I think about vector quantities, which is really what we're talking about here, things that have direction, I am thinking about adding negative values in order to have a more robust understanding and definition of what we're talking about. That'll come back as we talk about more and more things that have negative values and uh, negative directions associated with them. Now, the displacement, as we typically talk about it, is the total change in position over the entire time interval that we're concerned with. So let's look at this little dashed line here. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. The dashed line, let's say this is a runner or something. They move 70 meters to the east from their starting location. Let's say they start here, right, at the origin. This little blue dot that I'm drawing, that's their starting location. They move 70 meters to the east. Then they turn around really quick and go 30 meters to the west. Well, their displacement is the total end result, right? Let's say you've got, um, you know, I don't even know a time, 10 seconds or something to run this. That seems not that long. That would actually be world records because that's like, not world records, that would be near Olympic speeds because it's like, you know, 10 -ish seconds for 100 meters. So let's say you have 20 seconds to run this distance, right? You're gonna go 70 meters out, you're going to stop on a dime, turn around, and run 30 meters back towards me, right? Some big football play. You're going to go 70 meters down the field, turn around, come back 30 meters, and I'm going to hit you with a long pass. That total displacement is that cyan arrow, right? From that starting time, if we call this T1 and T2, are here's my location at T1, here's my location at T2, our displacement is 40 meters. Our distance that we travel, the total distance, well, that would be 70 meters plus 30 meters. That would be 100 meters, right? I ran 100 meters. I am 100 meters worth of tire. That's the ground I've covered. But in terms of the coordinate system, that's not my displacement because I ran out and I came back. 
there are times when that's going to be important in terms of the physical quantity that we're talking about, making that distinction between distance covered and the, the displacement from my starting location to my ending location. Here are, again, some quick diagrams that show um, those. Here we have two different instances where I have the exact same displacement, even though I'm starting and ending at different locations along my coordinate system. In the left-hand picture, I go from 50 to 30. It's a minus 20 meter displacement. And the second picture on the right-hand side, I go from 30 to 10. Different locations, but that's the same displacement. There's nothing different about the displacement or the distance for these two. All that's changed is where they are relative to the zero point. But if I'm only worrying about displacement, I would not treat these two displacements as anything different. If I ran from 10, right, if, if we change this to x1 and this to x2, well, now my displacement is positive 20, right? If that runner turns around and I am going in another direction, then it would be positive 20. Those would be two physically different displacements. Um, here we have two conceptual questions. I'm going to put these on Blackboard as well, so I would encourage you to go check out Blackboard. These will be uh, really quick, automatically graded questions. Um, one involves just conceptually the difference between displacement and distance, and one involves a quick calculation of that ant's displacement as it moves as, uh, as shown. Feel free to pause the video and go answer those questions now. They shouldn't take you more than a few seconds. Um, or you can do it after you're done watching the video, but this will be to do along with that calculation of the weight of the air in your room. That'll be due by, by Monday. Okay. Now, let's talk about our next physical quantity, which is speed. I realize my picture is covering up um, the title of the slide. Let me just move it right. Speed of a moving object. When the slides are posted, feel free to follow along if you want. When we talk about speed, if we are, um, we are considering a certain time interval, um, so we're starting a clock and stopping a clock, and over that time interval, we calculate speed by looking at the total distance traveled divided by the time interval in question. Uh, the units for speed are units of distance over units of time. That would be in metric units. We would have meters over seconds. So meters per second is always the unit that we use. Um, miles per hour is probably what you are familiar with um, in terms of driving a car or something like that. Um, we, we conceptualize miles per hour as our speed unit. Meters per second is what we're going to use, which means different numbers represent um, everyday uh, speeds. So just as a quick, quick calculation, Let's say, uh, to do unit conversion, let's say we're going 70 miles per hour, right? Um, you're driving to campus and you're a little bit late, so you're on the Lloyd going 70 miles per hour. Uh, don't pretend like you don't do that. Well, we're going to do our quick conversion. So there's 1,609 meters in one mile. And then we're going to convert the time. One hour has 3,600 seconds. So we get 32.1 meters per second. I didn't do the calculation in my head. I think I just remember that value. 70 times 1609 divided by 3600. 31.2, wah, wah, minus 10 points to Mr. Pollock. 31.2. Um, so a speed of 30-ish meters per second is, is going pretty fast, right? Uh, we typically walk briskly at a few meters per second. A fast run might be 10 meters per second, um, and then obviously we're going even faster and even faster, but just to have sort of a, uh, a grounding in reality for these, these values. Now, when we are talking about distance traveled over a time interval, we have, again, um, how far we go and how fast it takes to go that far are the two things we need to keep track of, both the numerator and the denominator. So if we have a car and a bicycle, we see... Um, they're traveling at different rates. We'll talk a little bit about this diagram with the dots in just a second. Um, the car covers a distance of 40 meters, right? They end at 80 and they started at 40. So the distance that they travel over the time interval of one second is 40 meters. Therefore, that speed is 40 meters per second. The bike only goes 20 meters. So they're 
going 20 meters in one second. The distance covered in a single unit of time. Here, it's a single second. There's our conversion. Now, we have to say, ooh, what about displacement versus time? Well, displacement versus time gives us a different quantity, which is the velocity. And that's really now just we're seeing in this diagram here, all that's different is the direction that we're traveling between these two bikes, bike one and bike two. Um, so the dots represent the location of the bike at every second. It's almost like we close our eyes and we open them really quick. Where is it now? One second later. Now. Where is it now? Where is it now? Um, so we are only keeping track of the location at each second when that second starts on the clock. So bike one travels from 0 to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80. It's moving to the right across the page. Bike two goes from 120 to 100 to 80 to 60. It's moving to the left across the page. And we see that over the time of one second, a time interval of one second, bike one and bike two both move 20 meters. Bike one goes from 0 to 20. That's a 20 meter distance. Bike two goes from 120 to 100. That's a 20 meter distance. But they aren't equivalent in terms of which way they're going. One goes to the right, so that would be a 20 meter displacement. Bike two goes to the left, that would be a negative 20 meter displacement. So I can talk about them having the same speed, 20 meters per second, but they're moving in different directions. So in order to account for the fact that they are moving in different directions, I need a quantity that represents that. I can't just say, well, they're both moving 20, and there's no way to describe one's going to the right and one's going to the left. Velocity is what describes which way they're going. The average velocity, the displacement over the time interval in question, tells us that bike one is going to the right, and that's a positive velocity because it's a positive displacement. Bike two is going to the left. That's a negative velocity because the displacement is negative. The time interval, we always count up when we're talking about time. Time interval is always positive. Therefore, negative velocities always correspond to negative displacements in our coordinate system, right? So now that importance of the choice of coordinate system um, comes about because it depends which way I said was positive to begin with. A negative coordinate system could be to the right or to the left, depending on the choice of which way positive was. Um, the easiest way to understand this is if you're looking face to face with someone, you don't agree on which way is right and left. So therefore, you don't agree on which way is positive under the usual um, conventions of a coordinate system. So uh, you uh, have to be sure that we're clear about in, in the space that we're in, which way is positive so that we can agree on the directions of negative and positive velocities. The, the differences that we're talking about here in terms of which is positive, which is negative, whether it matters which direction we have, what we're really getting at here is the beginning of a, a discussion we're going to have in more detail in our next chapter, which is the difference between vectors and scalars. But we can at least address this now, uh, even though we're only going to talk for a moment about one-dimensional um, cases. A vector is a physical quantity that has two pieces of information as opposed to a scalar which only has one. A scalar only uh, has the information of how much. So things like temperature, mass, distance, and just how big is the quantity that we're measuring. Um, sorry, I'm hearing some music and it's creeping me out, but I think it's just someone's radio outside. So um, a vector quantity has an extra piece of information which is which way is it pointing? It specifically has a direction associated with it. And we have these kinds of quantities in physics all the time. We're going to spend most of this semester talking about vector quantities. We've already seen displacement and velocity. We're going to see that we have acceleration as a vector as well. And force and momentum are two hugely important vector quantities that we use to describe the world around us. So whenever there is a direction associated with that quantity, as well as a number associated with how big the quantity is, um, that is what's called a vector quantity. We will work more with vectors and the mathematics uh, and tools that we have to discuss vectors in the next chapter, but that's really what we're starting to notice here in the difference between speed, just how fast is something going, 
and velocity, how fast and which way it's going. The easiest example um, we can think about in terms of, well, why does it matter? If I say you're standing directly in front of my car and my car in the next moment is going to be moving at 30 meters per second, nearly 70 miles an hour, um, you don't know whether to be worried or not because I could be moving towards you or away from you. Right? Or maybe I got T-boned and I'm going to move sideways at 70 meters per second. You don't know. That's because all you were given was the speed. The velocity is what's going to tell you whether you should be alarmed because the car is coming towards you or the car is moving away from you or the car is moving sideways parallel to you, right? So the the velocity tells us more information because it tells us which way that thing is moving as well. Just like displacement tells us where I am with respect to my starting location, not just how far away I am. Um, in two dimensions, if I have an origin and I say this thing is 10 meters away, well, there's a circle of possible locations where it could be. If I say it's 10 meters north, I know exactly where it is because the displacement gave me more information. It told me how far and in what direction. So it's a vector quantity. Let's talk really quickly about these motion diagrams, and that'll probably be it for our lecture today looking at the time. Those dots, uh, we'll draw those diagrams every once in a while. Those dots represent the location of an object as we saw when we labeled them every instant. Um, I want to talk a little bit about those so that we can use those diagrams without having to label one second, two second, three second, four second, five second. Um, those, those diagrams I'm talking about were up here. Zero seconds, one seconds, two seconds, etc. I don't always want to have to write one second, two second, three second, four. I want to just sketch these. So we have to be sure that we're clear on what these, what these things represent. If I have a car moving at a constant velocity, or like those bikes in those previous examples, the motion diagram has equally spaced representations to show that at equal time intervals, that car is moving through the same displacement. So I could draw just the dots. That's how a physicist draws stuff. I'm, I'm actually, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I'm actually pretty good at art unless I'm doing physics and I just draw dots and poorly drawn squares just because I'm going too quick. I get too excited. Um, <laughs> but that would be the same, the same motion diagram for that car. I move the same delta x every, maybe this is every second, right? I took a little picture and I'm moving through the same displacement every second. Now these motion diagrams can get a little more complicated when the motion gets more complicated because we aren't always traveling at constant velocity. That's what we have here. We're always moving at a constant velocity, but that's not always the case, right? I might be having any of these motions, right? Maybe I'm still. So my motion diagram is like this. Boring. Here's constant velocity. We've already seen that. Here is someone speeding up, right? So in the first instant, they don't go that far. And then the next instant, they go farther. And the next instant, they go farther still. That's a little bit of a different motion diagram. We'll start talking about that kind of motion next week. And then here we have the opposite, right? The first instant, this car travels a great distance. And then as we apply the brakes, we slow down. Then I could have, this is now chapter three, I could have motion in the x and the y direction where I see I'm changing in one but not changing the other if we look carefully at those. Those changes in velocity are what we're going to start talking about next week when we're going to have to define acceleration as the next physical quantity to say, okay, now when velocity is changing, we have a physical quantity because we have a quantity when position is changing. When position changes in time, I get velocity. When velocity changes in time, we'll see that we get acceleration. That'll be the next step that we take. I appreciate you watching this video on these Fridays. Um, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, please let me know. There are just those quick questions on Blackboard. Again, they're taking the place of what we normally would have done in class. So go ahead and do those and turn those in on Blackboard. Ask me if you have questions. Keep being your awesome selves. I appreciate all, you, all your hard work more than you know. Uh, and I'm always here for you if you need me. Take care. See you Monday.